And if Jesus Christ is our example and the apostles are those who inspired us, this prophecy conference illustrates if we have a pope of anything at all, it would be the Bible. It's the final word, praise the name of God. Though I must have to say this, everything predicted by us in this conference is not that infallible. <clears throat> Not even the foremost expositors among us are infallible as to what we say the Hebrew, Chaldean, and Greek words mean. Even the great scholars, because of the synonyms of the English language numbering in words itself perhaps in excess of 600 or even 750,000 words, the numerous synonyms and shades of meaning in the English language makes it difficult for any of us to claim to be an infallible authority on what all these words mean merely because we believe they mean that. We are subject to mistakes as were the two Jesuit priests in 1585 to 1615 who used Daniel's 70 weeks as the basis of proving that the Antichrist would rise during the tiny seven-year period at the end of the premillennial age of this world and use this to, in the counter-revolution or reformation against Luther or Lutheranism. They did this to protect their pope from the attacks. Their accuracy of Daniel's prophecy, right or wrong, was used uh, to project Antichrist at the end of the age only and they used it effectively because Luther doubted that revelation may not be inspired. Thus he defeated his own arguments among his followers because of his skepticism at first. Well, we are no more infallible today here than Darby of Scotland, who was among the brethren whose writings alongside with the Jesuits laid the theoretical foundation for Larkin's charts and Schofield's notes as well as Seiss, Sucrist, and later Ironside, Pentecost, and Hal Lindsey. These theoretical foundations were laid before we were born, and those who read into history know where the roots of our views are. Nor are we any more infallible than the historicists who wrote more than 150 versions of how the book of Revelation in history was to be interpreted. Though we retain the first three chapters, which agrees with the historicist's point of view. This is not to say that any general theory is necessarily wrong, but it only points out the need of returning to the author and finisher of our faith Amen. to help us solve many of the substantive details that we've closed our minds around and sometimes closed our minds to, to see what God may have yet to say about his coming and about our preparation for that coming. Say praise the Lord, if you will. The only infallible person here today would be me. <laughs> and that's not what my note said. I just thought I'd say that. What I said, the same lack of infallibility applies to me and to the subject of the Godhead. There can be no final authorities with a final word except God. Would you say praise the Lord to that? We know in part and we prophesy in part. But we do know this, however, that there is one God and none other. Praise God. It is only the nature of the Godhead that presents problems and questions. Now, it may, might be appropriate for me to tell of a vision I had 26 or 7 years ago in Paducah, Kentucky. I believe it was in 1954, 53 or 54. I had prayed from about 10 o'clock to about 3 o'clock in the morning, not because I like to pray all night, but sometimes you just can't sleep, you're just praying. Suddenly I saw a vision of the Lord. He walked in from the living room into the bedroom where I was praying and stooped over and whispered in a loud whisper 
and said, I am Alpha and I am Omega. I am God and I am man. I had prayed about signs and wonders and miracles that should attend the preaching of the word all those five hours. And yet he come to announce his identity. I am God and I am man. You say, not startling. It's startling when he distinguished between I am God and I am man. Distinctive, absolute manhood as well as deity encased. Well, I went to a conference at Madisonville, Kentucky just a few days later, and one of our brethren, now deceased, took upon himself to form a part of my Bible lesson to describe what the Godhead was like. And by his explanation, he had dissolved God into hardly more than a vapor. That is, his bodily shape and form had as far as his description, was now all spirit, using the text, though we have known Christ after the flesh, henceforth know we him no more after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that since there is no discernible image left, we do not yet know what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, whatever he said that'll be, for we shall see him as he is. He took this to mean that there was no certain form nor shape to the doctrine of God was in Christ or in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily or from a bodily standpoint. His language and, and his, uh, his speech was uh, uh, such a diffusion of, uh, of terms or such a, a, uh, a loose use of terms that God was only invisible and I suppose omnipresent spirit as if God in Christ had dissolved and in a flowing manner had disappeared into the rest of God in his omnipresence. And some of the ministers who were at the conference seemed to agree that that was the way it should be. I said, but my brethren, when Jesus rose from the dead, he was never to die anymore. He had a shape. He had a body. They saw it. Thomas felt of it. And he asked them to feel of him, to touch him, that, that he was not just spirit. He said, a flesh and bone. Spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. Our glorified man, our, our the immortalization of, uh, of the humanity assumed by, by way of the virgin birth. I said, this does not agree that this same Jesus observed going away, the same, not different, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go away. And that it did not take uh, his glorification to alter his bodily structure into some vaporous uh, spirit that uh, might disappear in the whole uh, space of God, if, if space is a fitting term to use about an unlimited being infinite as God is, but that was what I guess he lived with and died with and probably honestly held. But it did not describe the Godhead, I didn't think, nor does the three-person theory evolved on the continent of Europe after the church went into a dark period. Did the Gentiles, who left the spirit of the Jewish writers of Scripture and went into Greek logic, Aristotle's logic, in which he used the formula of Aristotle, genus, species, property, difference, and accident, which is a method of defining God. That is to say, God is a general being who subsists in three species, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or three persons, is how they, they reached it. They left the flow of Scripture to the non-flowing logic of, of Aristotle, using his definitional terms, to try to picture God as a one uh, general uh, being called God who subsists in three separate distinct persons. So they formed a concrete 
definition and lauds God in the concepts of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, which has prevailed upon the earth from about the third century on up until the challenge in 1914, and even before by the Quakers in the 19th century protested the three-person the three theory. What I'm trying to point out here is that there's an importance here that we understand the difference between a Bible description of God and a logical description of Aristotle, used by Aristotle to define his subject or to describe his subject. And that's what I'd like to point out is that the wisdom of the Greeks was used by the Gentiles after the death of Jewish writers and preachers. Paul all was gone. They resorted back. And the Roman Catholic Church has threaded through itself two basic logics, that of Aristotle and that of Socrates, which they is illustrated by Thomas Aquinas on Aristotle, which was later centuries, and by Augustine on the Socratic method. Well, you, this may have mean, mean nothing to you, but it's the foundation for Trinitarianism or Tritheism under the garb of Trinitarianism. At any rate, this is how the brain of these men worked according to Aristotle's logic to define God as one general being subsisting in three species of beings, or persons rather, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God the Father is not God the Son. God the Son is not God the Holy Ghost, so they say, and God the Holy Ghost is not God the Father. They are separate, distinct. Each one is God, yet not three gods, but one God. Such double talk is never allowed in any other field except theology. The foundation of all prophecy is God. He is the source of creation also, and of truth, and also of future events, and is the ending of all things in time and space. His existence today is not the question. The problem has to do with our concepts of God and our percepts of God. The mind works with its conceptions and with its perceptions. His existence, I say, is not the question. I use the term con concept or conception in the sense of those general notions of God that pertain to his, this is a term I've coined, I don't know whether it's a, a good one, but oneity, not unity, oneity. Everybody said oneity. Say it again, you get used to it. Oneity. Say it a third time. Oneity. They say the third time, you'll remember it. Pertain to his oneity, second, his nature as a spirit, his uh, radiation of power, consuming fire and light, his invisibility, his omnipresence, his omniscience, his love, and his substance of spirit and word. These are the general concepts of an infinite being. I use the term percepts to deal with those particular notions of God that pertain to his bodily image the theophanies, his incarnation, the dual natures of Christ on the right hand of God, and the term Lord or Yahweh and the term Adonai, Lord. The difference between the terms or the New Testament term, which may or may not be pronounced correctly by myself, Curious or Curious, which is K-U-R-I-O-S, however that should be pronounced, the inner communication within God, but it deals with Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, 6, 1 Timothy 3, 16, John 1, 1, and 14. But then you deal with God, not in general, not in particular, but God in a distributive way, in distributive terms as the Holy Ghost, distributed into separate bodies. God throughout and beyond the universe, God in Christ, and God in the church. One supreme being in three spheres, in and beyond the universe, in Christ particularly, and in the church in a distributive way, as God gives us of his spirit as individuals. Distinctions may be there, but not separation, as uh, our tritheistic and trinitarian Brethren seem to want us to believe. But 
dealing with God in his infinite nature, in his size, there's no way to get around him. 93 million miles to the sun. How many millions of miles to the outer planets and galaxies? Who would know how far? And yet God is everywhere. Would you say praise the Lord? If you speak about his intelligence, his omniscience, his all science, all knowledge of past and present and future, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, from the very foundation, so that he foresaw and by promise and prediction has told us in some measure about what he knows, and yet some scripture seems to indicate he had to find out some things, which was probably for our benefit. Also his om omnipotence, power that has no limits. He has no weaknesses about him. Unlimited size, unlimited intelligence, and unlimited power. These are superlative terms. They're used to express God apart from and as if he is not even a father, which is a relative term. These terms are absolute. They're as absolute as God is light, God is spirit, God is life, and God is invisible, or God is whatever term that's used absolutely of God as a quality or an attribute of his being. However, since there is no beginning of God, he is from everlasting to everlasting. When the word beginning is introduced, a strange phenomenon of language takes place. For we have to find from God the term of an unbeginning being from that of a God introduced at a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Space and time, so to speak, were invented. And because God acted to create the heaven and the earth, this action took the form of projected speech called the word. For in the beginning, and this term beginning is in contradistinction to no beginning, everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. But here a God reduces himself in his self-revelation to a beginning of a world of space and time called heaven and the earth, logs in space and projected out through time. But this word which God expressed and projected in the form of speech, called the word, was with God, not another being from God, but was God. God extended and projected into time and space by means of creation. All things were made by this Logos, our word. And there's nothing made that God made except he made it by the Logos, by the word that he spoke the worlds into existence. 48, 148, 5 of Psalms, 33, 6 of Psalms, and Isaiah 44, 24. You can look this up, you who buy the tapes. Words are expressions that identify and are described, which have been captured in symbols made up of letters constituting the alphabet. But they're not first of all written words. They're first in the form of living speech, either by God or by man. And they're captured in, in symbols, alphabets, combined into words and sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and books. But their first expressions of a living being are a living creature of some sort that can articulate his ideas and his words. They begin by speech. However, if words are more than symbols, and symbols only capture these words and their ideas, but there are also expressions which identify and are described, then any self-revelation that God makes of himself, that in any way identifies him and or describes him, may be called the word because it is the expression of God and reveals and identifies and describes God to that extent. This expression of God can be visible or verbal. And this is why when the word became flesh, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our ears have heard and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life which was with the Father was manifested and we have seen it. So that when a, the identification description of God takes on a visible form, it is logos, visibly expressed, rather than verbally expressed. But when the word was made flesh and also spoke, the word was not only personified, 
but the word also expressed, identified and described who he was, what he was representing, what he was expressing as the outward expression of the invisible God or God's character being revealed in the humanity assumed by means of the virgin birth in who, the one we call the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Logos, our word, by which God created the universe is perceived as an object, this is the perception side of God, it likely will be viewed as a noun. If the word is in action, it'll be probably verbally conceived or understood from a verbal or action standpoint. Hence comes the word, the Logos, as an image and also the word in the form of speech. 1 John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that the word was handled and seen and the word was also heard when Jesus Christ spoke. Like the sun, it has its own light within its own being, but the sunlight radiating from him radiates upon the earth and warms us and benefits us. There's no light upon the earth from the sun if there's no sun 93 million miles away to shine upon the earth. Thus you say the sun is out when you behold the earth. You say there's a sun when you view, behold the object from which the sun uh, light uh, radiates. Therefore we find the Logos is revealed to us in an objective form of Christ, the word made flesh, and also verbally the words which radiated from him and expressed him because Christ is the outer expression of the invisible God. Praise the Lord, everybody. These images that I speak of are objects which the eyes can somehow perceive are projected in the Old Testament, but not exactly in the image that God has, but uh, obviously for God's image or shape has apparently always been concealed. As Jesus said in the fifth chapter of the book of John, when he speaks to people who are looking upon him, mind you, looking upon him and telling these people here in 537 of John, and the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, neither seen his shape. And there Jesus was standing in front of them. Shape means something seen, external in appearance or form which means that even when God came in the Old Testament or came in Christ as a theophany or God in a body, that his pure and uninhibited shape still had not come through perfectly, even under the assumption of bodies like angels, as God appeared in angelic form, or even in the virgin birth and appearing as the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, if you turn to the second chapter of Philippians, you'll notice here that the shape of God, or form of God, another Greek word lies behind the term, but it tells us a substantial the same thing, who being in the morphe of God, the shape of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the morphe, or form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Though he existed, as the Tritheists say, subsisted, but the term subsist is not there. He existed in the form or shape of God, which brings a dual notion of God, God without a shape and God with a shape. This is not always perceived nor conceived by our oneness brethren who are called Jesus only for our lack of, uh, of language that shows the absoluteness of God, the relatedness of God, and the particularity of God, all these three phases, so that we use perceptive scriptures only and, and fail the scriptures that, that have to be conceived in heart and mind apart from uh, you know, your ability to perceive things. For, for instance, People have the notion that the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in Jesus bodily. But they forget that the word bodily defines what's said before. Because all of the quantity of God does not reside in the small body of Jesus. 
God is everywhere. Say praise the Lord, if you will. But the body of Jesus is the only body God has in the Godhead. Praise the Lord, everybody. When we say that Jesus Christ is God in a body, we're saying this is theophonic, or God in a body, like the term means. And, uh, and, but that does not mean God is limited. But it means that you're not going to look for two or three or half a dozen bodily bodies or shapes. You look for the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, everybody. But we must let our uh, public know that we do not deny any part of the wholeness of God that in his total quantity we acknowledge, but we do not acknowledge that God has two or three separate bodies that he dwells in, but that he is a spirit omnipresent, no limit, but that Jesus is the visible expression of God in the flesh he derived from Mary to make himself known to us. Words, as I say, are expressions that identify and are described, which have been captured in symbols made up of letters that constitute the alphabet. And this is what Jesus claimed to be. I am the Alpha, and I am the Omega. I am the whole alphabet. I am the total self-revelation of God to man and to angels and to the universe. I am the God expressed in the beginning. And when time is no longer, and when the heavens and earth have passed away and eternity begins again, I am the ending. I am God within the confines of space and time as he's made himself known. And if you know me, you know what God's like because I outwardly express what the invisible God is like wherever you may find him in the whole universe or beyond the universe. However, as I said, if words are more than symbols, they, but also expressions that identify and describe, I'd like to pass on here, God had, and I don't know, as I say, I'm infallible on one thing, there is one God. There's a question as to whether God always had an image that is prior to creation always had a shape. I have brought myself to this uh, tentative uh, opinion that uh, if the image of God is a part of God himself, that it would have to be from everlasting because you cannot increase God's size nor any of his uh, qualities or attributes or, or himself in any way. He is absolutely God, whether it be dealing with his omnipresence or his appearance in a shape, a perfect shape. Now, it's not easy to say because the word image doesn't come all from the same word. Sometimes it means character, like in 1-3 of the book of uh, Hebrews. He is the express character of God's substance. And may I pass on to say that the word person has been one of the most... Uh, difficult terms for us to use with. King James Version translates using the, uh, the humble term person to apply to God in 1-3 of Hebrews. Also Paul's words uh, from the Greek are translated, if I forgive anything, forgive I not in the person of Christ, dealing with a man who had sinned, and he himself was willing to forgive him, it said in the person of Christ. But if we only realize that this thing crept into and become a part of our language long before we were born, but has a very humble origin and is not that significant that it should capture our theology and imprison our future th thoughts because it's become prominent, the word person. You never even call angels persons. Whoever said uh, that angel is a person, either in scripture or in common language? Who's ever said uh, that a monkey was a person? One fellow says a person means one who has intelligence, feelings, and will. I saw a chimpanzee that had intelligence. He got real mad, showed his feelings, and he had a will to fulfill those feelings. He must be a person. He qualified. 
None of them define the word person as something like a human being with a body, soul, and spirit. But the word person as a term comes from the lowly custom of actors who put on a persona or a mask over their face to portray parts on the Greek and Roman stages. And when they change from humor to, uh, to something of a, of a crucial or, you know, mournful sort, defeated part, weeping, sadness, they change their mask to portray uh, another character. So persona, or person, comes from the lowly practice of merely a mask on the face of an actor who might play the numerous parts. But the time of 1611, when the King James Version uh, ceased, uh, was rather was finished, the word person had for hundreds of years gotten into the language of theology in particular from God subsisting in three separate and distinct persons from the fourth century on in, the, in one of the creeds. So that we have been captured by a language problem in which we think that the word person has to be used about God. It's not necessarily so. For they tortured the word person into Hebrews 1.3 when the same term in Hebrews 11.1 1 is not translated person whatever. For what he speaks of Christ being the express image of his person in Hebrews 1.3, the same Greek word, and I'm not going to break your ears like I break my jaw trying to pronounce these Greek words, though we can always go to a good concordance like Young's and find out how, what these words are and what Young says they mean. Praise the Lord, everybody. But he calls it faith is a substance of things hoped for, not the person of things hoped for, but the substance. Same word as the word person in Hebrews 1.3 where Paul forgives in the person of Christ could easily, in the stead, or representing Christ, or acting on his behalf as an agent, an ambassador, as he was indeed an ambassador. Most of us have no claim to such a title. He, being an apostle, had the high title of ambassador. We have smaller agency roles to play under Paul's type of ministry. So the word person is not necessarily something we have to hang on to, except we want to limit it and call a human being a person now. And thus the person of Christ could be, in my opinion, as I'm not speaking infallibly today, could be his person as a man. And I would like to, and the time is moving too fast, uh, I believe I'm going back to, uh, to some other time in the world because my time is coming to an end here. But we, we have been so habituated to think of an intelligent expression from any being as being a person. That's why the Godhead has been divided into three persons. Because the Father has spoken while the Son was listening. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Ghost maketh intercessions with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that knoweth the mind of the Spirit as if the Holy Ghost is talking heavenward. In other words, the inner communication of deity is oftentimes complicated by these terms like person. It has to be a person because here comes speech from the Holy Ghost in a man, here comes speech out of the sky, and here comes the speech of God out of Christ Jesus, the voice of God out of the cloud, and when Christ is standing with Moses and Elijah, and the word person, the concrete term, which grew from the lowly term of persona, mask, has so captured and holds the mind of our Trinitarians in a bind from whence they have never been able to deliver themselves. But if we would only learn that God can't be captured entirely by our vocabulary, he's bigger than the universe. He can speak from a million different places on a di million different subjects at the same moment of time. There is no way to limit God as to a speech from a cloud or from the sky or even from a dumb ox or from around the universe in so many multitudes of voices, if you please. But by likening God to a human being, we have almost idolized God. I mean, like human beings are full-footed creatures by the term person. 
That's affected our whole thinking so many times. But the Holy Ghost came in the people of the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Ghost was in 120 different people, and separately, as well as together, spoke out of 120 people at the same time in other languages which none knew what the others were saying. If the Holy Ghost can speak 120, let us say not languages, perhaps there was some languages that was not known by the comers, but there was all of those who did come from the different nations, the Jews out of different nations, heard the foreign languages they had understood being bilingual people. We do not know how many of the rest of the people spoke other languages around the globe that no one there understood at that time. But it shows us that God can speak from 120 or from a million or from one. But you don't have to call another person because he speaks from another direction, another place. But that word person has locked us in into a prison house of semantics without us knowing what's happened. And the Trithists and Trinitarians have been imprisoned for all these long years. And we want us may be imprisoned and be called Jesus only for the rest of our days if we don't develop language that shows that we believe in all of God. Praise the name of God in all of His ways. In general, in particular, and in a distributive way, as the Holy Ghost distributed to millions of separate individuals. Not millions of Holy Ghosts, but it's a name called that general experience called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So we're dealing with great distinctions, but not separations. We are afraid sometimes of language, but distinctions in God but not separations of God. There is a sense in which God is viewed as a shapeless, omnipresent spirit in a conceptual way. He is perceived also as an image or a shape never seen by man, except only in theophanies, which is not an exact replica of his image. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, tells us that there is a heavenly vision image rather and there is also an earthly image and while it's dealing with Christ in his heavenly image it also tells us by suggestion that there is a an image of God that we must consider in verse 44 it is sown a natural body that's this body it is raised a spiritual body if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written that the first man, Adam, became a living being. This is international version. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Let me go to King James, the original language that Jesus spoke in, I've heard said. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and after that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Of course, it becomes a great mystery of how it could be that the second man is the Lord from heaven. And he speaks here about who existing in the image or shape or form of God took the form of a servant. Two forms are implied. Colossians, the first chapter, tells us that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is not in the image. He is said that he is the image. It's found in verse 14 and 15, especially 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, every creature, all creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It appears you're dealing with a previous age before the incarnation when this vast God 
must have uttered his creative speech through this image, not in the image, but the image of the invisible God. This is hard to perceive, that God is shapeless and vast and unlimited and can be perceived as an image. We've made great problems out of this. Let us make man in our image. Sometimes we said that is prophetic, dealing with a future time to come. But Genesis 5 tells us, and verse 27, So God made man in his own image after his own likeness. You see, that means his character. Not at all. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 says that man is the image and glory of God. The woman is the glory of the man. He's talking distinctively, not about Eve, but about the creation of Adam being in the shape of God, in a broad, general shape of God. Angels are also created after this manner, in that general image. And yet, as far as we know, that image has been concealed. And yet Jesus told people looking right straight at him, you've never seen his shape which simply means, that is the Father's shape, which simply means that the shape had to be concealed in a theophany, in a body that was assumed by means of the virgin birth. Because if Jesus Christ is the Father, as he said, my Father dwelleth in me, if he indeed is the Father, then he had to dwell in a son, like a vacuum bottle that has its outside shape and its interior shape. It is two shapes, synchronized, but not the same. It is somewhat like on the Mount of Transfiguration, when that inner image, God, shined out over Jesus Christ, and his countenance was altered, and his face shined like the sun, as the divine image overflowed the human image that had been adopted by the virgin birth. And they saw that Christ was more than somebody born of Mary, but very God, the image of God, had in a mysterious way incarnated as the inner image of that outward man. Praise the name of the Lord. And it shined and radiated on the Mount of Transfiguration. Praise the name of God. So that one man says, you just touch me and feel me. A spirit hath not flesh and bones you see me have. Realize that I'm a man. And then turn right around and Thomas explained to me and never being disputed, my Lord and my God, giving it the other side of the coin of who he really was on the other side. Now that is not simple, how that could take place. Because God is supposed to be unchangeable. How could he so reduce himself or expand himself or project himself. When the Bible says, I change not, it means that any ability, any part of his nature or any ability he had is the same regardless of any age. He doesn't change. It also meant in that instance that God has a moral standard that he was condemning these people for and says, I don't change. I was against it a long time ago and I'm still against the sins that you're committing. I don't change about such matters. But it's his ability to take on different shapes and forms can be seen in the theophany when Moses saw God, as it is said, an angel appeared in the bush of fire. Or when Jacob bristled all night, a man, but said he saw God face to face. God's versatility and flexibility remains the same. And how he can express himself in such a viable and, and such a, a, a multitudinous way or a variety of ways, God, who he is and what he can do, never changes. For he can appear in a theophany, or can hide behind a cloud, or he can conceal himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say praise the Lord? And he mostly was concealed, so that most people today don't really know who he really was really, as a matter of fact. Praise the name of the Lord. Let me finish my notes anyway. I've asked one brother, lest I fall on my face, please stand down in the front so he can catch me in this little place here. Therefore, in a the theophonic sense, God revealed and also concealed himself. And is called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And is called son of God, son of man in the New Testament because of the merger of humanity and deity. 
which makes him God in his deity and man in his humanity, and yet combined in a miracle. This final theophany, as uh, is oftentimes said, is apparently the blending of the two images to form one container, the image or the shape of God concealed in the shape of man. It seems, as I said before, that we have yet a lot more to learn about God in Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. I said praise the name of the Lord. I said praise the Lord. When I say that I know in part and prophesy in part, it's not a, it is not a trip of humility. It's an awful fact that humiliates and humbles a person. To try to deal with such a vast, unlimited subject and use the limits of the speech of a human being with only God revealing himself in part to any one of us. I've seen Jesus more than once. I've seen him and it seemed like his humanity glows at some times. Other times his deity stands out forefront. He's the most complex being or, or using it, 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 these sense loosely is the most complex in as much as it's like dealing with two at one time. When you think you have plumbed the depth of him and you pick up your little line and pole from the ocean and find that you've only gone a few feet beneath the surface, then you see the vastness of God overrides any kind of knowledge we may have of God. So that we say, Lord, save me or I perish. Please save me or I perish. Praise the name of the Lord. I said praise the name of the Lord. And I've used them here especially. When I'm using the term concept, I'm not using it in the full meaning of the term. I'm using it in the sense we have a conception in our mind of God in all that absolute infinity, the uh, unlimitedness of him as a spirit being with no boundaries of power and of wisdom, past, present, future, as a spirit invisible, only invisible because the light we have does not reflect off of him that the eye can pick up as a photograph. Doesn't mean angels cannot see him. Does not mean that God as a spirit will never be perceived when we have new bodies and new eyes. But as we're now constituted, there is no earthly light that can shine upon God as a spirit and reflect upon our eyes and take a picture of what he's like. The angels do perceive God in his spirit nature. We will after the rapture, which our brethren says is going to happen very soon. I hope they're right. But they told me that, brethren, in 1938 through 1945, and they used Schofield, too, and they used Larkins, too, and uh, they used Sice, too, and they debated it also. I missed it then. If he come, I'm sure out of it. But you have to be careful, I would think, on that subject, just like the Godhead. Hold back enough reserve, because we might be saying what is partially true and may not have the whole thing. They missed it a long ways. Many a sermon died when Mussolini's heels was kicking up in the air with his mistress on a pole in Italy. Many a sermon died when Hitler burned in the fire and they kept him alive for several years to keep the sermons going. <laughs> Finally, after all hope was gone, Stalin, they nabbed him and the red tide come pouring in and he died on them. Mr. Roosevelt died on them. Poor old Kissinger, he's failed and passed off the scene of action. This March, I'm beginning my 44th year in preaching, and I've heard a lot of it. And I've read most all the books on the subject. And I don't know much more now than I did after I finished it, really. Then what do you say about the Godhead, Brother Reeves? No, we're looking through a small part of the telescope, a very small part of it, and that we have yet to learn the massiveness of this subject which we want as people champion, and I believe God is supporting us. 
I say, and I believe God is supporting us. Also, we have to beware lest we have no bridges to retreat on when our predictions do not materialize that which we gain from the headlines. We have to be careful lest our ministry of prophecy be killed by a wolf, wolf kind of a cry. If it never happens, it will, it will cause us to be in doubt. The most important threads of prophecy, if I may so come on this, are not, it not made known by either parables nor made known by symbolical language, just like in law. They do not permit symbols nor parables to define. They only illustrate by these means. But solid legal doctrine is formed by precise speech that declares thus and thus is thus and thus. And then cases illustrate it in case there are precepts laid down. In scripture interpretation, parables will illustrate usually one thing. Symbols are so profusely used and logical speech in John and Revelation I'm saying we should be very cautious lest our ministry be thrown in doubt and some ministers were thrown off a of prophecy for years to come. It's fair for me to give warning here to that because our ministries are too important and the things we're saying are important, but we should never think we have exhausted the total knowledge that we have yet to gain and leave yourself an opening for God to come in and maybe help all of us. Say praise the Lord, if you will. The same thing goes with the Godhead subject. If we fix and close our minds to any future perceptions or conceptions of God, but it should be grounded in Scripture it, even though it does come as a fresh thing to us. It should be as solid in Scripture as past things we've learned. Let's keep ourselves open. No use to hate one another if there's some small differences that come because whoever made us final authorities on the Word of God, only God knows the whole book as far as the Godhead or prophecy is concerned.